<laughs> Some of you guys are new to this thing where, oh, he's a pastor, he must wear a suit. I, I never wear suits to our service. Um, I actually preached at, at the elementary service, not children irritable, but children evil. Um, so that's grades four, five, and six. And uh, man, it's a tough crowd. <laughs> it's like 200 kids, so it's, it's a really big crowd. And personally, I have no confidence preaching in front of kids because my experience started from college students and up. And so I, I don't know what I'm doing. Um, but part of the reason why, well, I wore the suit because it was kind of protocol, I was kind of required to. Um, but also because I was using myself as a physical prop about transformation. I was explaining about how I've gone through a recent physical transformation and how I was trying to encourage them to know that they can have an even greater spiritual transformation through God. That, that was kind of what I was going for. Um, but this is actually my most recent suit. This is from my, the July wedding that I officiated, so we had this made for that. Um, so this one makes me look the most slimmest. Um, so I was, I was going for that, you know, just like, just, you know, kind of hitting them from multiple sides. You're like, damn. Anyway. Um, <laughs> so, welcome again. We, are, uh, we are, are here. We're going to the book of Ephesians. And uh, before I get into the word for today, the question I want to get to you is, what do you think of when you hear the word saved? We're going to talk about what it means to be saved by grace today. But what do you think of when you hear the word saved? Now, you can think about this yourself. I'm going to throw up some random things because you're going to think I'm kind of weird. But, you know, these are the things that came to my head when I think about the word saved. Now, this tells my age because immediately I thought of saved by the bell. Um, now, some of you are laughing. Some of you are like, what is this? What are these clothes? Like, this is early 90s fashion. What is this? Look at the hair. But anyway, um, this was a popular show when I think I was around high school, saved by the bell. Um, like... Honestly, the career of all these people, the careers are horrible. They all kind of didn't turn out very well. Um, but this was a very influential show for me when I was a younger person. And the, the term saved by the bell kind of is kind of that thought that like, you know, something bad is about to happen for you at school and then all of a sudden the bell rings. You know, saved by the bell, right? <laughs> Teacher asks you a difficult question that you don't know. You're about to make a fool of yourself and then the bell rings. Saved by the bell. Right? <laughs> um, anyway, I, I was tempted to sing the actual song, but I won't. Um, but but the other thing that, that when I heard the word "saved," um, you know, I I, I watched the, the show Smallville. This is a little bit more recent. Some of you are still like, "What is this?" Um, I know we have a very broad age here, um, but this was a show basically about young Superman, young Clark Kent before he became Superman. Right? It's like it's like. Clark Kent in high school, right? But the reason why this came out is because of the theme song, right? The theme song was like, somebody save me. Anyway, <laughs> only a couple people got that. Moving along. Now, there's actually a movie called Save. This is 2004. I'm getting closer to the present time. Um, but this is 2004. This is actually Mandy Moore. Um, now this is you know much. This is a long time. That's actually Macaulay Culkin, Home Alone, right? Ah, <laughs> Macaulay Culkin, right? Um, this this was a very controversial movie because it was kind of mocking, like I guess, like Christianity back then. It was, it was sort of doing that, but it wasn't completely doing that. But I know a lot of churches didn't really appreciate it. Um, but yeah, I don't know. This, this this thought came to mind because it was this kind of a commentary. This is like the cool pastor's kid who's like like kind of like your anti-christian he's christian but he's not but, I, but anyway um you know this this is movie 2004 or, or or maybe also you know you you see those corny things whenever you see the term jesus saves and so you know you have jesus saves the usb um jesus saves he's got coupons you have jesus saving the, the the soccer goal there's also a hockey version of this um so many of you probably have different Thoughts when you hear the word saved. I'm just going through some random ones. Um, this is just to kind of wake you guys up. Um, but with that, let's go in the passage for today. <laughs> Ephesians 2, uh, verses 1 to 10. Ephesians 2, open up your Bible, smartphones, or look at the screen. Ephesians 2, starting with verse 1. Where the Lord says this, As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. 
But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions, it is by grace we have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Particularly these last few verses, it looks like our screen is like off center. Um, so we're kind of getting the, 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 the uh, we'll fix that later. But anyway, um, yeah, this is this is one of the kind of the epic passages in the entire Bible particularly for those uh, that, that come from more of a Protestant tradition, but I'll get into that a little bit later. Um, <clears throat> but for us, our, our theme for this year, 2018, is Emmanuel, which means God with us, through the wilderness. So whether we are going through seasons of difficulty or seasons of joy, our hope for this year is that we would truly recognize the presence of God in our lives, that we would feel that intimacy, that He is with us no matter what we're going through. So we've been going to the book of Ephesians, and honestly... Just to be frank, I've been having a hard time with the book of Ephesians, particularly chapter 1. Chapter 1 is just like, it's like this epic story, and like it's just like, like these run-on sentences, right? Paul has these two, like one 202-word sentence and the other 160-word sentence. He's just like stringing these long, crazy thoughts that are like cosmic in, 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 in scope. Um, but he's trying to show us how much God has blessed us in every possible way in Christ Jesus and the Holy Spirit has given has been given to us as a seal and as a mark that this is true right? that we are experiencing this on a daily basis and he continued last week in, in the, the latter part of chapter 1 talking about how you know praise and thanksgiving for what God is doing may God give you the spirit of, of, of wisdom and revelation May he continue to open your minds and hearts to see what he is doing and that you may know the incomparably great power that God has given to those who believe. Right? The same power that raised Christ from the dead, not only raising him from the dead, but seated him at his right hand where he sits and he reigns. Now, the, one of the main points from last week was that Jesus is not just gone. He's not just risen. He is sitting at the right hand of God and he is actively reigning, he is actively involved in our lives right now. And so as we get into this, um, you know, the, the question that comes up when it talks about you have been saved by grace, well, what are we being saved from? This is what, what it goes off in the very first couple verses, it explains what our situation is. So last week we were talking more on a broader scale of Christ and the church. We're now talking more about us individually, our situation between us and God. And what it says is, we were destined for death, right? We were destined for judgment by God. And so, honestly, brothers and sisters, like this, this comes off as a bummer, but the reality of what this is telling us is that when we were born into this world, there was nothing that could save us, right? All we deserve because of our sinful nature was death and judgment by God. This was the only thing that was guaranteed. Right? Now, I don't know, maybe I was a bit of a pessimist. As you guys know, like the, the quote I keep sharing of myself in 1999 was, people suck, trust God. Um, but that kind of tells you that I have a very low view of humanity. The reason why is because um, I started to realize at a relatively young age that we're pretty messed up. <laughs> I started to think about myself as a kid, and I was, I was, I, I, for some reason, I have very vivid memories of certain parts of my lives, and I was like, man, I was a messed up kid, right? I told this before, but like, you know, I was, I think I was like in third grade, and me and my, my, uh, I was going to a Baptist private school, okay, so I'm wearing this, this uniform, this Oxford white shirt and these green khakis, uh, you know, I'm at this private school, and me and my friends had just learned some four-letter words, right? <laughs> Our world had been open, we're like, whoa, 
these words are crazy. <laughs> and we were so excited. And like, we were like saying it under our breath, like, you know, so like, you know, like, the teacher wouldn't hear. And like, we were doing stuff like that. But then we came up with a plan. We started writing these words down on a piece of paper and we rolled it up like a little scroll or something like that. And we hid it in the playground with the intention that we hoped that kids younger than us would find it, start reading the words, get in trouble. I remember doing this in third grade. I was a messed up kid. <laughs> like, I even remember like younger, I think I was maybe like an infant or something. <laughs> and I actually remember there were these shelves. Um, yes sir, you'll, you'll experience this soon too. There were these shelves and there was like this bowl at the top, and for some reason I thought it would be a good idea to climb up those shelves to get to that bowl. But while I'm doing this, I'm like pulling the shelves out, and like the bowl falls, and like everything breaks. And I remember doing this. I think I was probably like you know a little bit older than Sarah. This is crazy. And so, so for me, actually, I, I kind of grew up in the age. Uh, granted, I'm, I'm giving my age away again. Um, <laughs> I, I, I like in college was when the show South Park came out. Right? South Park's actually still on, isn't it? Um, now, I actually really like the show not because of its humor. Because I was like, wow, this show is like, it's real. Like it's it's like talking about like things that are like you know it, it's 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 funny it's crass but there is truth behind it. Uh, and like I remember when the movie South Park the movie came out, it was like one of the most ridiculous movies that was ever made. Um, particularly those of you guys that are Canadian, you probably didn't like the movie. <laughs> um, but, but like it was actually one of the reviewers said it was the greatest social commentary ever made. I was like, that's kind of true. Right there, I, remember, I remember there's a scene where there is a pastor, a minister, and he's got a collar on, and he's at a bar. I don't know why he's at a bar. He's at a bar, and he's next to Jesus, and he looks at him and he says, who are you? Anyway. Um, but, but so, but one of the things about South Park is it makes kids look evil. And it's because they are. <laughs> this is true. And so, for me, that's <laughs> us. <laughs> but, 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 but what this is telling, what this told me from, a, like, like, I really got this when I was in college, was that this is what I deserve. <laughs> this is what I deserve. And so for those of you that know theology, you know, you have your five points of Calvinism, the first one, T, Tulip, is total depravity. Right? And it's one of the things that really got me very quickly, was that, man, I'm unworthy, right? Something has to change. And so what the passage continues, it, it shows us that, that this desire to sin doesn't just come from the inside, it also comes from the outside, the, the world, the, the age, you know, the people around us, and it's also supernatural. It talks about this prince of the air, right? There is actually a supernatural being who is trying to make me sin. And so what, what Ephesians Two, the first couple of verses really show us is this is the picture that we're in and this is why. There are it's working at us in three different ways. There's no way we can fight against this. But then it says, God by his great love and rich mercy chooses to do something radical. Right? A lot of times people ask me the question, why isn't God fair? Right? It's a very common question. And um, for me, the, 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 the thought behind the question is, the assumption is, if God is fair, then everyone deserves love. Everyone deserves salvation. That's the logic behind that. But for me, as you already know, I have a very low sense, a low view of humanity. So for me, fairness is everybody dying, right? <laughs> and so for me, I'm like, thank God God isn't fair. Because if God was fair, we would all be going to the same place. We would all be marked for destruction. But by His great love and rich mercy, He chose to do something unfair by showing us mercy, by showing us grace. And this is what grace is. Right? Grace is, is when we are given something absolutely amazing, something that we are unworthy of, and we have done nothing to earn it. It is undeserved merit and favor. This is grace. Right? 
I joked before, Grace is the most common name, and I talked about the Grace Lee Project. This is a real movie, by the way. This girl, Grace Lee, she made a movie about all the other Grace Lees. Um, but, but basically, you know, she was like saying, like, oh, everyone think Grace Lee, she's a good Christian, she plays piano, she, you know, uh, she's really smart. I think the heart, actually, I, I, I watched one of the trailers. The heart of the movie was that she was trying to show that every Grace Lee is really different, right? Um, that, like, some of them are, like, are like, you know, I think there's like Grace Lee, what's her name? There's like this Chinese act, Chinese American activist, Grace Lee Box, what's her name? Um, so like that kind of like shaped the whole movie, but that there were like these radical Grace Lees. Yeah, I play piano, mm -hmm. but I'm radical. <laughs> <laughs> so so that, that's what she's trying to show. But what I want us to understand is this is not Grace. <laughs> Grace is not just a name. The reason why Grace is such a, a popular name in Korean Christianity is because it's, it's one of the fundamental things that we need to understand to know what salvation is. Now, before I get to this, um, actually, let's continue. So the other thing that, that we're told is, not only are we, are we saved, but just like how Christ was raised from the dead, Christ was also seated next to God the Father. This passage is telling us that power that saved Christ also saves us, makes us alive, takes away death, raises us up, and seats us next to Christ. Right? That's an amazing statement. Not only are we being saved and being restored, but we're actually being elevated. Right? We're actually being brought up to the same level that ultimately Christ is. That in Christ... God actually sees us like he sees his own son and, and values and cherishes and loves us as he sees Christ. And ultimately, later on, we too will be seated next to God just like Christ is. That, that's what it's telling us. In the long run, this is something that we're being given and this is, what, this is where we're headed. Salvation is an amazing thing. It's not just restoration. It's not just making a, a wrong right, it's actually something much bigger, much greater than that. And it continues, now last week we talked about the incomparably great power of God, but now we're talking about the incomparable riches of His grace. So Paul is using similar language to help us to understand that the same power that raised Christ, in that same way, God is giving us so much grace. God is showering us with grace in a way that we cannot comprehend. So that he can show his kindness. Now this word automatic, when I hear the word kindness, I'm thinking of the word hesed from the Old Testament, which is a very common theme in the entire Old Testament that shows the heart of God toward his people, that he wants to give them not just kindness, but he wants to show them so much more, this, 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 this faithful love. Right? Hesed is, is just one of those words in the Old Testament in Hebrew that, that has such a very rich meaning. And, and I think Paul is kind of touching upon this by saying, this is God's desire for you. He doesn't just want to show grace and mercy. He wants to bless you. He wants to shower this on you. He wants to show you His kindness in a way that you can't even imagine. Now, when we get to this part where, where in, a, in verse 8, where it starts talking about how you are saved by grace through faith. Now, again, um, I might be dating myself, but when I was in youth group, there was a song called Ephesians 2, 8, 9. Um, I don't think anybody knows this song. Very rarely. <laughs> For by grace, do, 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 I have been saved. <laughs> okay, <I'll stop. laughs> but again, like, you know, this is, 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 is one of these fundamental phrases that really show what it means to be saved. And I think this is one of the things that people have gotten confused over in the generations, and it keeps going back and forth. So we are saved by grace. I'll explain a little bit about more what that means. And it's through our faith. So there's an element where it is almost entirely God, but there's also an element where we have to show our faith toward Him as well. There's a push and pull that's going on here. 
and the passage continues and says, it is a gift of God. You guys know what a gift of God is? In, 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 in Greek, this is a, a name, actually. You guys know the name? This is a... Uh, okay, I'll give you a hint. The, the, the shorter form of this name is Teddy. Theodore, right? Theodore. Theo is God. Dore is gift. Actually, there was a girl at Yonsei whose name was Theodora. Um, so I was like, oh, gift of God. She's like, oh, you know, you know, real. Well. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the only time I actually met a female Theodora. Uh, although I know that name's been used in history in the past. But, but basically, you know, Paul is telling us this is a gift of God. Being saved by grace is a gift of God. Right? There is nothing you did to deserve this. And he keeps hitting that point. And he says, not by works. Right? Now this is one of those things, especially if you look at the book of Galatians, Paul really gets into this, that it's not the things that you do that save you. Okay? Brothers and sisters, there's nothing that you've done, there's nothing that you can do, there's nothing that, that, that you will do in the future that will save you. Salvation does not come through our actions. It is only through grace. It is a gift. Now this has been kind of... Now I, I kind of come from the generation where... where Actually, well, let's go further back. You look at the Bible and there are basically two quote-unquote enemies inside of the church. And I've talked about this in the past. Number one, you have what they call the Judaizers. People that said... You have to do this, you have to do this, you have to do this, you have to do this to be saved. And they were basically um, making like grace something that you have to do other things on top of. It wasn't just a gift. Then you had the other side, people that were called the libertines, where they're like, God's grace covers everything. We can sin as much as we want. We just have to ask for forgiveness. And so like you have these two extremes. Now... This has unfortunately been a cycle throughout history where it goes back and forth. Now I kind of come from the age where you know I grew up in the Korean, like you know the Korean American immigrant church, right? And um, it's very easy, but uh, you know, for whatever reason, my parents' generation really focused on actions. Right? How do you know you're a believer? I go to Sunday school every day, right? I tithe. Right? This is back in the day where like, there would be churches, actually there are still churches that do that this here in Korea, but churches that actually print how much people tithe every week. That's that generation. That giving was a very, it was important because Korea was so poor, but it was also something that started to become a measure. That you had to give a certain amount to be considered a quote unquote good Christian. So you had attendance, you had giving, um, and, and all these different things that that Christianity, especially for my parents' generation, it became a list of do's and don'ts. And so, growing up under this weight, you know, I think my generation of, of second generation Korean Americans, we're like, no, the Bible teaches about grace, fight, ah, like, you know, like, like we fought back, right? But I think, honestly, my generation went too far. We're all of a sudden like, oh, grace is so great. Like, you know, like, there's, yeah, like they're so so wonderful. I can just be free. I can be myself. And then like basically we went to the side where we didn't do anything. Right? We're like, like basically like I, I think my generation of, of of Korean American believers, church was just an action. Um, it's something that you had done as you grew up, but it didn't actually affect how you lived your life because you know you had been taught that you had been saved by grace. So okay, there's nothing I need to do. God did everything. I'm just going to live my life. I'll go to church every now and then. And so that, that's kind of, I think, how my generation kind of went to the extreme. And that's not entirely correct either. Because right after Paul writes this, in verse 10, you have been saved by grace through faith, not by works. It is a gift of God, but you are God's handiwork. Right? Created to do the good things that he prepared in advance for you to do. So on one side, yes, works don't save you. But then on the other side, you were created to do good work. Right? So one of those like, what? 
I don't need to work to be saved, but I need to work. Like, what is this? And, and so what, what this is telling us is that God's intention for us, we are His creation. We are His handiwork. He wants us to bless others. He wants us to be His hands. He wants us to be His feet. He wants us to be His representation on this earth. These good works do not save us, but these good works spread His plan, His purpose. As I said before, as one of the corrections that I've been kind of dealing with recently, and one of the things that I, I talked about earlier in, in the book of Ephesians, is that the intention of Christ is not just to save us. The intention of Christ is actually to restore creation and to bring it all back under unity under Him. It doesn't end with our salvation. Our salvation is just a starting point for us to be part of this process of bringing shalom, bringing peace and restoration back into all of creation. So brothers and sisters, you are saved, hallelujah, but there is work to do. And one of the things I don't like about the NIV translation is it kind of doesn't say this. It just says, you know, created for to do the works that we're created events to do. It just says to do. But really, the, the more literal translation of the latter part of verse 10 talks about how God prepared these good works for us to walk in them. Right? And walk will be an important word because it's going to come up later in, in, in the book of Ephesians. But walk is, is, is one of those words that's used throughout all the Bible in, th in terms of the Old Testament and the New Testament to describe how we live our lives. And this is why some people even say, like, you know, when they're asked about how you're doing spiritually, how's your walk doing? Because right? for us spiritually, it is a continuous action. Walking is something that you are continually doing. As you walk, as you go, you are living your life. And so these good works are not simply things we're meant to do, but we're to walk in them. We're meant to continue to live and to do these things. And as James 2, the latter part of James 2, very famously says, faith without deeds is dead. That if you are a believer, brothers and sisters, then there should be good works that are coming up in your life. That doesn't mean those good works save you. But that is evidence. Those are the, that is the byproduct of someone who believes in God. Is someone who acts, who does good works, who God uses in that way. Now, to kind of sum this back up, you know, I want us to understand that that this great power that was talked about in chapter 1 continues here. And so God, by His great power, as well as His great love that is, is brought up here in chapter 2, He is the one who saves us by His grace. We have been graciously saved. And as His handiwork, we respond by doing the good works that He desires us to do. This doesn't save us, but we do this because we want to. We do this because we know what He has done in our lives. We do this because we desire to spread His kingdom and to bring back the shalom in creation. Right? At the end of the day, good works are done. But the reason why is different. So for, for some of you, if you're coming from the standpoint where, where you feel your faith has to do with, with doing things, right? If you feel like your salvation is dependent on these things, if you're coming from that, that pressure, I want to release you of that right now. There is nothing you can do, nothing you will do that can save you. It has already been done. But at the other, on, on the other side of the fence, if, if you're someone who accepts that, but then chooses not to do anything, and I say, <laughs> God made us so that we could be partners with Him, that we could be working with Him, right? That's the interesting thing about God. God, if He wanted to, he is so sovereignly powerful, he could make things happen with a snap of a finger. Right? He's greater than Thanos. Right? <laughs> I'm sorry, I always bring a marble. I'm a nerd. I'm sorry. 
God is greater than Thanos, right? You don't need no, 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 like infinity stones. <laughs> but the really interesting, mysterious, and cool thing about God is He wants us to work with Him. He wants us to express or to experience the joy of, of being His co-laborers. For me, one of the, the most, uh, I think, uh, one, one of the coolest experiences I had was, um, you know, I was still an engineer at the time, and I was going back and forth, and, and uh, I was helping with a, a mission, like an English camp that we were doing in Russia. My parents had become missionaries in Russia a couple years prior. And the first time I just went with the team, and I was one of the teachers, but the second time I went, they asked me to be the director, which is actually pretty stressful. Um, so I was, I was running the whole camp, but it was like for the first time I was actually working with my parents. Right? It was a really interesting feeling. So before that, I had always been the little kid, you know, the one they kind of like shoved in the corner or like I stayed in my room and played video games during the crewing of it. And like, you know, I was, I was always the little kid that was kind of hidden, right? And the other little kids would, would play with me and I would kind of forget who they are and they would meet me later and be like, how come you don't remember me? I don't know why I'm saying this, but anyway. Um, so that's who I was, but for the first time in my life, I was actually shoulder and shoulder with my parents, co-laboring. Co it was such a cool experience, and you know they were they were they were so thankful, and, and God really blessed that camp. And uh, this this is actually what happened just before uh, my company got sold. So my company got sold, and basically I was handed this big lump sum of money. My original plan was to go to seminary, but because of that experience of working with my parents, I was like, you know what, seminary can wait. I'm going to serve with my parents for a year. And that's what helped me make that decision, was having that experience. And so, brothers and sisters, I know it's, it's, it's a small, small analogy, but God, in His same way, even though He could make everything amazing and great, He wants us to be His agents. He wants us to be the ones helping this cause happen and to experience the joy and the glory of being cool laborers. So brothers and sisters, not only are we saved by grace, but we are still called to be His handiwork and to do good works for Him. Stop it. <laughs> <laughs> so brothers and sisters, be free to serve Him. Right? Don't serve Him because you think you have to. Don't serve Him because you feel obligated. Don't serve Him because you think this will make you in a better relationship with Him. That's all done. God loves you. God sees you as, as His own Son. Nothing will change that. So now be free to serve Him without expecting anything. Now be free to serve Him and to just to experience the joy of what that is, to work with God. Let's do some kind of prayer and we'll go ahead and close for today. Um, brothers and sisters, first I want us to just Come to God with a heart of thanksgiving, that God, thank you that you have saved me, Lord. Thank, that, thank you that I was in a position where I could not do this myself, but you, out of your great love and your mercy and by your grace, you saved me. You sent Jesus to die in my place and take away the, the burden that I could not bear on my own. So let's just take some time to just thank God. Thank you.